Welcome back students. So far we have uh, looked at the nucleus, the binding energy of the nucleus of the atom and the binding energy per nucleon and uh, using the graph we have also deduced the nature of the nuclear force, the attractive force. We said that the nuclear force is a very strong force because it, it needs to to keep all these protons which are actually repelling each other together. So uh, it's a very very strong force and, and even though it's a very strong force it will operate only over a very short distance, a very very short distance. And because if it was operating over a longer distance then the binding energy per nucleon would not remain a constant. It would, it, it, it would have become more if we were dealing with heavier elements. So uh, that doesn't happen. So that's the reason we say that the, uh, the nuclear force is a short range force uh, and a nucleon uh, can only get connected, can get bound with the nucleons near it, not too far. It cannot get bound with every nucleon can only get bounded with only a few of them. So only then, that's called as this, you, you almost reach the saturation value there. Okay, so we, uh, we talked about it. So the binding energy, binding, binding energy of the nucleus, binding energy of the nucleon, and the nature of the nuclear force are the things that we have discussed so far. Now, we will talk about what is called as radioactivity. Uh, why does it happen? You know, uranium is radioactive material. You know that. And, uh, and there are other materials which are radioactive too. Uh, many, many, many of them, thorium. Many, many materials which are radioactive. Uh, why does uh, a nucleus, an atom, become radioactive? Well, it depends on the nucleus. If the nucleus becomes unstable, if the nucleus cannot hold itself, then it will break into a smaller element. Okay? When it breaks into smaller element, because it's, it's looking for stability, we say the smaller the element, the greater the, the, the stability. right? Uh, uh, because we said like if there are more nucleons on the outside then the binding energy per nucleon would be less because you will find more uh, nucleons on the outside which have not which are not connected with which are not um, exhausted the possibility of connections but a nucleon inside would connect with as many as possible. But then the nucleons on the outside can connect only with the nucleons inside and the, the, out, out, the outside surface of those nucleons, you know, so even though they can get connected, they don't get connected because there are no nucleons. So clearly they bring the binding energy per nucleon down. So this can lead to Oh, instability. The nucleus may want to break into a smaller nucleus and thus try to get more stable than it already is. Okay. So when it does this, then radioactivity takes place. Then there are um, particles or, 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 or materials which are ejected from it. And we call this as uh, more like a, as, as a nuclear reaction. Okay? So you, have, you know what a chemical reaction is. You know how to write those equations and stuff. But this is what is called as a nuclear reaction, you can say. Uh, radioactivity takes place because of that. So when radioactivity takes place, energy will also be released. Understandably. Because from being unstable, it becomes stable, meaning the surface area is going to get reduced. So there will be a, a uh, more binding that is going to take place. Okay. Uh, 
so as more painting is going to take place because the nucleus tends to be smaller uh, because you know the number of uh, nucleons on the surface will, will, will come down so uh, then when they connect then a certain amount of mass is going to be lost and that mass that loss of mass ma that loss of mass will come out as energy given by einstein's equation so whenever there is radioactivity you can expect uh, energy there there are three types of radioactivity the alpha decay the beta decay and then the gamma decay we'll study about them but the first person who systematically studied this was henry becquerel in 1896 he did a study of this uh, what he did was he uh, uh, like he was He was, he was basically studying the, uh, the fluorescence uh, and then the phosphorescence of uh, materials. What is fluorescence? You shine certain light on a material, then it shines. Okay? It, maybe it will have a different color. That is fluorescence. Phosphorescence, well, if the, take this material, you, you light that material, then it, it glows. Then you switch on the light, then it stops glowing. That is fluorescence. But phosphorescence is the glow will still be retained even after you switched off the light. So that's the that's the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence. Fluorescence will stop as soon as you switch off the light. But phosphorescence means that it will still glow. The material will still glow even after you switched off the light. So so he was Henry Becquerel was studying this. Then what he did was he took uranium. potassium sulfate material and then he put that in a packet and then he covered the packet with a um, black paper and there was also a photographic plate uh, and he kept silver between this packet and then the photographic plate then he switched off the light and then he went there was no light actually um then what happened was that when he came back and looked at it after several hours the photographic plate that had been darkened which means it it is been exposed to some kind of radiation uh and that radiation certainly must have come from uh, this this packet containing uranium potassium sulfate okay, that material and it was able to penetrate the black paper around it and then the silver that was standing between this photographic plate and this uh, uranium uh, potassium sulfate material so it is very really strong to to go through this paper and then through silver to hit the photographic plate and he was surprised and then he started studying about it more so uh, the whole thing started there in 1896 yeah, again as i keep saying 1900 now you are in 2020 so everything is only about 100 120 years old all that you see all great inventions and stuff they are all very 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 recent you need to understand that they were not there before okay uh, so and a year ago people did not even know about any of these things anyway so so henry becquerel was a person who studied radioactivity systematically and then we have made too many strides uh, in that field so as i said there are three types of radioactivity uh, one is alpha decay and then beta decay gamma alpha beta gamma so it's very easy so radioactivity So three types: one, alpha decay; second, so beta decay; and then third is gamma decay. So there are three types of radioactivity that happens. Okay. In the alpha decay, what happens is that the unstable nucleus starts emitting. helium nuclei when the helium nuclei obviously without the electrons because you know in the, in the nucleus there are no electrons right so basically we have only protons and neutrons but unless protons and neutrons disintegrate uh really when unless neutron disintegrates you won't get electron right? anyway so that's separate so you have only protons and neutrons there 
and uh, you have uh, an unstable nucleus and what this nucleus does is it starts em uh, emitting the helium as it keeps emitting helium nuclei then this the nucleus will become smaller okay. and this radioactivity is called as alpha decay so the uh, the parent material sends out helium as a daughter material and uh, you know, as, a, as a radiation and then you get a daughter material we'll see it here okay. uh, it's like this uh, so you have some material I call this as X okay. and then it may have an atomic number A or Z and then a mass number A I do it the different way. So you have an element X, then it has atomic number Z and then the mass number B. So in the case of alpha decay, what happens is that this gives rise to first helium. Okay. Oh, I'll, okay. I'll give, the daughter would be Y. Let me not come to the daughter yet. Then I'll talk about that. So I'm going to get helium out of it. So one nucleus gives you one, uh, one nucleus of this uh, atom gives you one nucleus of helium. So that is 2 and she 4. So, so this is what you call as the alpha particles. This is what is called as alpha particles. Okay. So each nucleus will be sending out one uh, helium nucleus. So then, now that you've got this, then what would be the mass number and then the atomic number of the daughter nucleus? Well, you got you lost two here, and two protons are gone, and this is like mass number, right? The two protons are gone. So from the uh, uh, the atomic number of Y will be Z minus two. That is the atomic number, and the mass number of Y will be A minus four. So we we'll get a new material. An example I can give is this. Example is uranium 238. So when I'll use a different color now. I'll do that. So uranium 238. So uranium which is 92 and then this is 238. So it's an unstable nucleus. So when it becomes unstable, since it's unstable and it will undergo radioactivity. And what type of radioactivity does it undergo? It undergoes the alpha decay. When it undergoes alpha decay, then it's going to emit the helium nuclei, which is alpha particle. So this is the alpha particle, right? So I'm going to get less 2 HE4. So then what am I going to get? I'm going to get some element which is 92 minus 2 will be 90. So 90 plus 2 must be 92 protons. So the, the right side must balance with the left side. Okay. Clearly, I get 90. So 90 is thorium. And what I've got here, 238 minus 4, I'm going to get 234. So the new element will be thorium 234. So I have uranium 238, and then it's, it, it sends out alpha particles, then it becomes thorium. Okay. See, these are all pole numbers. 238, 234, 4, they are pole numbers. But you know, what, what will happen when the size reduces? As the size reduces, a certain amount of energy will be released. Why? A little bit of mass, which is not captured here. It's a very, very small amount of mass. That is not going to make any difference to the uh, 
uh, to the mass number because like, these are big numbers and it will be very 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 small. A very small amount of mass would be converted into energy. So with this you will also have some energy. The energy will also be raised. So that would give you the difference in the masses. Well, the, uh, this particle will carry that energy. Okay, the alpha particle will carry that energy. Because, you know, what is the momentum when it is at rest? It's zero. So the, uh, after, you know, the release of the alpha particles, the momentum should, cannot change. The law of conservation momentum should be there. So this alpha particle gains certain velocity. So meaning, if, if it gains that velocity, then clearly you have some kinetic energy there. And where would that come from? It will come from that mass which is uh, uh, which has been converted into energy. Okay. And uh, uh, this thorium will also move at some distance in this direction. Because the law of conservation of momentum cannot be violated. Okay. I hope you understand this. You have a certain amount of uranium-238 at rest. Now, it becomes un it's unstable, so it starts disintegrating. As it disintegrates, it's going to emit alpha particles. As it emits alpha particles, the law of conservation of momentum has to be obeyed. So now you have velocity. A part of the mass has a velocity this way. So the remaining mass should also have velocity in the opposite direction, so that the net momentum, the final momentum, should equal the initial momentum because our forces are internal okay. and you gain a uh, certain kinetic energy here so th that kinetic energy comes from this mass conversion that little amount of mass that you converted into energy so that provides this explosion kind of thing mini explosion or whatever I'll say which sends these particles there so that amount of mass is getting converted into energy so I say the 238, uranium 238 is converted into th thorium and the alpha particles and some amount of energy. Usually you don't write it and you stop with this and you will you'll match this. Like a chemical equation where you match the, the number of uh, uh, molecules, atoms uh, on both sides. You will also match the, uh, the atomic number and then the mass number. So you see 92. So 90 plus 2 must be 92. You cannot have, suddenly no pro, uh, proton cannot jump in. Okay, so the, the, the total sum should match. And then 238, 234 and 4. So their whole numbers, they exactly match. I mean, they, they match. Okay, so 234 will be 238. Uh, 238 will be 234 plus 4. But then there is a bit of mass which you lose in this process. Because the, the, uh, the, the nucleus now becomes more stable by losing a part of it, the surface area is reduced because it is lo losing uh, four of the nucleons. So the four of the nucleons are lost, then the surface area is going to get reduced. And because they get reduced, then more bonding can happen. And uh, because the bonding can happen, a certain amount of mass will be converted into energy. It's a little bit of mass. It's, it's a very, very small amount. Okay. So, that comes out as energy of these particles. It's not something separate. It's along with this. Both of them will have some energy. Okay. This will move in this direction. Tautoria will move in this direction. And alpha particle can move in this direction. So, you see, both of them will have some energy. And if you sum this, this energy, then that will be equal to the, uh, to the mass that you have lost. Okay. Through the mass energy relationship equation given by Einstein. I hope you understand uh, this part. So this is a nuclear reaction, you can say. Uh, like a chemical reaction, you have a nuclear reaction where you balance the atomic number and then the mass number. Okay. So this is a chemical reaction. This is alpha decay. Okay. And uh, the beta decay, I'll give you an overview now, then we'll get into it a little deeper. So when so here in alpha decay, helium is released, right? So in the beta decay, what happens is in beta decay, it's of two types. Beta decay in this case 
it's going to be either an electron or a positron. So when this happens, and when an electron is emitted, you call this as beta negative decay, beta minus negative decay. And this is called as beta plus decay. So it's beta decay. In this case, this is electron and this is positron. So what is positron? Positron is like electron, it is similar to electron. But then it has the opposite charge. Think of this, if an electron, it's like an electron, but now it has a positive charge. Electron usually, electron has negative charge. Now you, you get something like electron, but then now it has a positive charge, like a proton. So that is called as positron, electron and positron. Uh, how they come? That's a little, that's a slightly different story. Uh, see, every matter in this universe will have an antimatter. Okay, everything will have an antimatter. For example, if you have an electron, the antimatter of electron is positron. If you have proton, there is an antiproton. If you have a neutron, you also have an anti-neutron. Okay. So you have uh, uh, the anti-matter and anti-matter pair a pair uh, is available for everything in this universe. So what happens is when they combine, so what happens when electron meets with this positron, when matter meets with antimatter? Uh, see, you need to understand this. Proton and electron are not antimatter. Matter and antimatter are almost identical, or they are identical except for, for the charge. Okay, they are almost, almost identical. Okay, so uh, so an the antimatter of electron is positron, the antimatter of proton is antiproton. So when they come together, when they when the mat when when matter and antimatter come together, then they vanish in a flash of light, electromagnetic radiation. The, they won't. They will. They will not remain any longer. Again, energy can can create matter and antimatter. Okay. Um, uh, likewise, the proton and proton, proton and antiproton, when they come to come together, then again they will vanish in a flash of light. So what I would suggest to you is that if you ever uh, happen to see your anti self. Okay, suppose you know if it takes uh, one of you guys, um, maybe Nikolesh or somebody. Okay, if you if Nikolesh finds anti Nikolesh, Nikolesh, you don't shake hands with that person. Both of you will vanish in a flash of light. Okay, so uh, that's the nature of of matter and antimatter. So positron is the uh, antimatter of electron. They are similar except the charges are different. And again, this is a proton, we also have anti proton. And everything in this universe has this anti thing. Okay, matter and antimatter pair. So, some nuclear reactions can emit electrons like this, and you call it as beta negative decay. Then, when positrons are emitted, then you call it as beta positive or beta plus decay. So, that is this. We'll get into that a little later. Okay. In the, I'll show, show, give you examples of this a little. The third one is gamma decay. So what is gamma decay? Gamma decay is nothing but photon emission. It's nothing but electromagnetic radiation, photon. Okay. So gamma rays we know of electromagnetic radiation. We saw that, right? So first you'll have infrared, and then visible light, and then ultraviolet, and then X-rays, and then and gamma rays. Gamma rays are called the high energy photons, okay, light. So this is light, high energy, very high energy light. So this, this, this can also be emitted when uh, materials uh, decay, radioactive materials. So these are the three types. Here, alpha decay, you get helium nuclei. This is the alpha particle. Helium nucleus is the alpha particle. So alpha decay, 
is helium nuclide. Beta decay is of two types, beta minus and beta plus. Beta minus, you get electrons emitted from that nucleus. And, uh, and beta plus, you get positrons emitted from that nucleus. And then gamma decay, it is just electromagnetic radiation. Light is getting emitted, not visible light. Okay? It is light with high energy. I mean, all electromagnetic radiations are called as light, but not it's not visible light. When you say we generally use light as visible light. When you, when you say light, it is not visible light. It's very high energy uh, photons. Okay. But you know this. E is equal to h nu, right? The, the, the frequency increases when energy increases for the photon. So gamma rays will have very, 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 very high frequency. Okay. Uh, so this is. These are the three types of radioactivity there. Okay. Uh, we'll do a, a problem, a, a small problem, to explain this, and then we'll talk about this. In this. Okay, we're looking at example uh, thirteen point six. We are given the following atomic masses: uranium mass is given, and helium mass is given, and thorium two thirty eight, I should say, and thorium two thirty four mass is given. And then protonic mass is also given, and uh, 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 protactinium mass is also given. Okay, like there are five things for which the masses are given. And then it, it, the question of the, these: A. Calculate the energy released during the alpha decay of uranium-238. Then show that uranium-238 cannot spontaneously emit a proton. So you need to, first one is, uh, you have to calculate energy released during the alpha decay of uranium. And the second part is you need to show why uranium-238 cannot just emit a proton. Stop. Okay. Can't do that. Why? That's the question. Well, uh, first, let me list down the uh, uh, the nuclei. First, example thirteen point six. So what are the things given? Uranium two thirty eight. So uranium ninety two is two thirty eight. What's the mass of this? Mass of this is given to be two thirty eight point zero five zero seven nine. So two. 38.050 This is atomic uh, mass unit. Notice it, this 238 is what you say, but actually it is slightly more than 238, a little bit of fraction. So you kind of uh, round it off and then say it is 238, slightly more. Okay. Uh, and then thorium 234. So you got thorium here. It's 90, and then this is 234. What is the mass given here? It is 235, 234.04363. So 234.04363. Atomic units. And protoactinium is 91, 237. So protoactinium. 91 and then 237. And what is this mass? Actual mass is 237.05121. See, you only have 238 slightly more, 234 slightly more, 237 slightly more. Next, helium. So helium is here. It's 2 he so that is actually 4.00260 atomic mass units. And then proton, that is H11. Okay. Hydrogen, right? Proton is simply the hydrogen nucleus. So 1H1. This is a proton, remember this. 1.00070. I think it should be 727. Seven. 
Okay. This must be the. Uh, I don't think it's seven eight three. Okay, it's seven. It must be seven two seven because if it's seven eight three, then we're talking about the atomic mass. It, it, it includes the mass of the. Um, uh, electron also, I suppose. Okay, let's see. Let, let's not worry about that. Uh, so it is. It's, it's given. So now, what is the question now? The question is this. Calculate the energy released during the alpha decay of uranium-238. Okay. So this, this is the data given. So first, what is happening? The alpha decay of uranium-238. So you got uranium, so this is 92, and then this is 228. So if it undergoes alpha decay, then what I'm going to get? And we have here. It's going to be H helium 2 and 4. So then the remaining element must have 90 as the atomic number and then 234 as the uh, mass number. So that is thorium. So you get thorium 90 plus 234. See that? 234 plus 4 must be 238, 90 plus 2 must be equal to 92. So clearly, seven amount of energy will also be released. So this is the nuclear reaction here. You got. So, so what should we do now? Okay, so you have some mass. Now you have this mass, and you have this mass, and let us see how they uh, fare. Okay, uh, they compare. So, what is uranium two thirty? So, the mass of uranium. I call this as X. Okay. So, take mass of this is this is X. This is Y. This is alpha. Right. Uh, so, what is the Mass, mass of this and mass of this. Can okay, combine that? 234 and then helium 4, right? 238. And then if we sum, I get you see 0, 4 and then 5. Yeah? If we sum this, let's say. Mass of this will be uh, thorium. Thorium plus alpha. So that's going to give you this is 3 I get 3 and then 6, 6, 12 no? 3 plus 3 6 and then 4 0 2, 38 2, 38 0 0.0463. I've added in this and in this units. What is this uranium? 238. So you got uranium. Uranium was 238.05079. You see, the original mass was slightly more than the resultant. The mass of the react uh, the products is less than the mass of the reactant. That is the difference. This is more, now you get less here. So this is uranium 233. So, where did that extra mass go? That mass became energy. So, what is this mass difference? So, the mass difference, let's say delta M, is equal to mass mass of x minus mass of y minus mass of the alpha particle right so this is what it is so that is equal to yeah, this is m, m y plus m alpha is what you got here 238 so that gives you um, 0 0.00456 0 0.00456 atomic mass here. that's a different problem. so this mass is lost now this mass is not there this was there initially now it is not there so this mass must have got converted into energy so the energy is now so energy you call it as Q okay, it's going to be equal to delta M 
into c square. So 0 0.00456 into, you know, like this is an atomic mass unit, so you need to convert that into kg, and uh, then c squared is what you need to put. But then you know the, the equivalent, right? You, you know, like it's 931.5 uh, mega electron volt. You know that already. We'll discuss it already. So for uh, one atomic mass unit, this is the amount of energy you will get. So you got so much of atomic mass unit. So you know, uh, then we will multiply this. Then this is going to give you 4.25 mega electron volt. 4.25 mega electron volt. Okay. So one nucleus, one uranium nucleus, just one atom, one nucleus. When it disintegrates, when it decays, when it undergoes alpha decay then it's going to create one thorium nucleus and one alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. And in addition to this, it will also create this 4.25 mega electron volt energy because the sum of these two is less than the, the mass of uranium-238. So the difference in the mass must have got converted into energy. And with that energy, Alpha particles move in that direction and thorium will move in the opposite direction. So alpha mv squared and alpha mv squared if you put, then if you combine them, come combine those two, uh, and if you divide that by c squared, then that should give you the difference in the mass. So mass is getting converted into energy. So this is the first part. Then what's the second part? The second part is this. Show that Uranium-238 cannot spontaneously emit a proton. So why would it, why should it emit only a, a helium, the alpha particle? Why can it not emit a proton automatically? That is something that we will see now. Let's see. So the B part is this. You have Uranium-238, 92-238. Now they are asking you to say whether the spontaneously uh, this uranium will disintegrate uh, into a proton and something else. Okay. Uh, we need to see if that can happen. Let's see. Let's suppose that this is disintegrating into a proton. So what are you going to get from? If this is going to disintegrate. You are assuming that this is disintegrating into a proton and something else. Okay, let's see. So proton, you say this is 1 H1. So that's proton. So you got you lost one here. Okay, so, uh, this element, the new uh, element must have, new nucleus must have 91 protons. You had 92, you lost one, so you must have 91 protons now. Let's do that. So 91 protons, that is protactinium. So this must be protractinium 91. And you lost one mass here, so you know, this must be 237. So this is 237, pro pro protractinium 237. If this were to disintegrate, you don't know whether it's going to do it. Suppose if it were to do this, then this is the equation, this is the reaction you get. Okay. okay. We don't know yet, we don't know whether it's going to do it. Let like, us suppose that it's doing it. And this is what you get. Let us see then. Okay. What is going to be the mass of this, the reactants, rather the, the products, the daughter uh, nuclei? Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, protractinium is 237, right? So you say, uh, let me sum it up now. So if you take protractinium, protractinium 91, 237, this mass. It's actually this 237.05121. Okay. Then what is the mass of a proton? It's given. 1, 1 is equal to 1.00783. That's what's given here, right? Okay. So if we add these two, then it will be 4, 10, 1, 9, 
0.8238. So this is the mass of the products. So what is the mass of uranium 238? You started with what? You started with uranium 238. 92 238 it's 238.05079 look here you started with this can you have something like this you cannot no not here it cannot happen spontaneously this won't do it automatically why because the resultant mass is more than the initial mass the final mass is more than the initial mass that cannot happen spontaneously. Well, it is still theoretically possible for you to give some energy to this, and that energy can get converted into mass, and the remaining uh, uh, mass, you know, can get split into these two. But it, this cannot happen spontaneously. It may, it may probably, it will probably happen if you give uh, you know, energy. But left to itself, left to itself, uranium cannot disintegrate into this case. Why? Because after disintegration, you have more mass than you started with. That cannot happen. So this, so uranium will not disintegrate spontaneously into this. So this cannot happen spontaneously. I hope you understand this. So the next uh, type of decay that we are going to talk about is the beta decay. I said beta decay has two subtypes. One is beta negative decay. Beta negative decay where an electron is emitted. And in beta positive decay, where positron is the matter. So you have a nucleus, and suddenly there is something that goes on inside the nucleus, it becomes unstable. So what happens is when an electron is emitted. Why would an electron be emitted? Well, how did you even get an electron? In the nucleus. Okay. Look at this. You, you have a nucleus, you have protons, and then neutrons, proton and neutron, or I should say, I don't know. It is a neutron, neutron, proton, neutron, proton, or something like that. So the section is like this. We said that the neutron has mass which is more than the proton. Okay, we said when the, the neutron, if you just take it out, uh, then it decays into a proton and then an electron. So if you add the mass of proton and then the electron, then you get the neutron mass. So neutron is slightly more than the proton uh, in terms of mass. Okay, so it's roughly the same, but slightly. It is. It's a combination of proton and electron. So. If a neutron disintegrates in a nucleus, then what will happen is that a neutron when it disintegrates, then this is what happens. You get a proton, 1H1. What is this? This is the charge is 0 and then the mass is 1, the neutron. So here for the proton, the charge is 1, mass is 1, plus then the electron. Okay, there is electron, right? So what is the charge? Charge is minus one, then the mass is zero. This is for the electron. And, and then you also have another a small particle, which is called as the antineutrino. Anytime an electron is emitted, then you can also expect to have what is called as an antineutrino. You know, the, the neutrino project, which is uh, creating a lot of, of, of controversy, uh, in Tamil Nadu. Okay? People are against the neutrino project. Uh, the, the project. Uh, uh, 
there are uh, agitations and the demonstrations that people do. So I'm talking about that. Actually, uh, the neutrinos are particles. Again, you have a neutrino and also an antineutrino. So antiparticle, matter, antimatter pair. Okay. So uh, here, when an electron is emitted, you also have an antineutrino emitted around the field. So let's do this. Okay, this is antineutrino. I bar over the centre. So generally, what the way we write this is, um, we write this as E minus electron, okay, plus then this one. So anytime you have an electron, a bar, then you have an antineutrino too. Just keep that in mind. Uh, so I can also write this as this, right? H1. Okay, one H1, and uh, this is what it is. This proton, this proton, one H1 is proton. And this is electron and then antineutron. So these things together become uh, a neutron. The neutrinos are very, very, very light particles. They're very, very small. They're much smaller than even the electron. You know that electronic mass itself is negligible. Uh, but the uh, the neutrino mass is even even smaller than this. So th they're very, very small. Uh, neutrinos are very very small particles, both neutrino and antineutrino particles. They're very very small. They can uh, they can go through matter without interacting with it. It's so small that they can just pass through matter. They say that some neutron, uh, so some neutrinos, they can hit the surface of the Earth. Okay, they can come then go go through the entire Earth without getting. Uh, with, without interacting with any other atom there. So they can go and deflect throughout. It's so small that it can happen. It's very, very difficult to detect these particles, the neutrinos and antineutrinos. And that is why the neutrino project, if you, if you recall, uh, that, is, that, that lab is going to be set up much deeper into the Earth. Uh, you know, like it's, it's not, it's not going to be, the lab is not going to be set up on the Earth, because they have to set it up much deeper in the earth. Okay. Uh, and that is the, uh, that, that's a concern that the farmers are raising. They say, well, if you, uh, to, to construct that lab, what would you do? You will dig, right? You will dig a few kilometers there. As you dig, and then if you construct it there, uh, what's going to happen? Even if it's half a kilometer, then what's going to happen now? Uh, all the, uh, the groundwater, because you've created a hole there, then from every other place, it will just go and uh, deposit there. So, and people will not be able to get the groundwater from there. The groundwater level will go down. You will not be able to get it. So that is the concern uh, the, the farmers are uh, raising. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this is the this is about the neutrons. Why do you even have to have a lab over there? It's because it's very difficult to detect them. I mean, uh, you just go down to the over there, then. Uh, you will be able to, all the other particles will be you no know, filtered on the, on the surface of the earth itself, right? No, not many particles will go down. But neutrinos can pass through. Neutrinos can pass through the entire earth, we said. So you will be able to capture them in that lab. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the intent of building these labs, the neutrino laboratories, uh, deep uh, on the earth. So that's a, a side note. But let's come back to this. So a neutron will disintegrate into a proton and electron and then an antineutrino particle. Anytime you have an electron emitted, you will also have an antineutrino particle emitted. So that is that is what happens. So if this happens, suppose in this nucleus, if a neutron, uh, for some reason, the nucleus becomes unstable, and then this neutron becomes proton. When it becomes proton, it will emit an electron and also the antineutrino particle. Now then, this will become a proton. When it becomes a proton, then clearly the atomic number has changed. So now it will become a new, the different elements now. So one such example is this. One such example is phosphorus. We take phosphor phosphorus, phosphorus 15 and then 32. So what happens here, that it becomes it, it becomes unstable and then it emits an electron and also 
an antineutrino. So what is this? Then basically minus 1 plus 0, right? Mass is 0, this is minus 1. So what is going to happen here? So this will be, I need to get 15 on this side, but minus 1 here. So I must get 16 here. 16 minus 1 should give me 15. So 16 is actually sulfur. Okay, sulfur, that's it. So these don't have any mass or negligible mass. We saw that. It's a little bit fraction, but we can forget that. Okay, so 32. So for all practical purposes, these, these things don't have any mass. So this is what happens. Okay, so a phosphorus nucleus getting, getting unstable and it gets converted into a sulfur nucleus, a new atom. It is made into a new atom, a new element. Uh, in that process, it emits an electron. When it emits an electron and uh, an antineutrino particle, then it becomes sulfur. So, a beta negative decay is an emission of an electron. And it happens because a neutron inside the nucleus getting, is getting converted into a proton. That is, so, then you will get this electron coming out of it. So when, it, when electrons come out of it, then you call it as beta negative decay. And what is beta positive? This is beta negative, right? This is beta negative decay. What is beta positive? Beta positive decay. In this case, a proton, say 1H1, a proton is getting converted into a neutron. Here, a neutron is getting converted into a proton. Here, a proton is getting converted into a neutron. So, a neutron 1, 0, then you must have 0 mass here, or oh, 1, sorry, 0. You must have uh, no charge, but you must have some, uh, the same mass as proton, almost the same, right? 1, 1. Then this is 0. So, then the remitted particle cannot have good mass, like uh, reasonably uh, amount of mass. Like only it can only have negligible amount of mass. So, this is going to be E, okay, then this is going to be 1, right. So, this put here, this is electron, E, electron, the negative charge, and then mass. Here, positron, with a positive charge, with no mass, just like electron. And when this comes out, and the neutrino comes out, you see. When electron comes out, antineutrino comes out. When positron comes out, then you get neutrino. Okay, so this is this is this conversion uh, results in uh, beta positive decay. Okay. See, there is something that you need to understand. A neutron is heavier than proton. So this this can happen spontaneously. If you take a neutron out, then a neutron, I told you in the very beginning, that in a thousand seconds, okay, the, it, can, uh, it can become a proton and an electron. That is what we discussed in the very first class of this lesson. Um, it can happen spontaneously. But this cannot happen spontaneously. Why? Because a neutron has a bigger mass than this. Right? Even though you say 1, 1, it is slightly more massive than this one. Okay, so, it cannot happen outside, it can happen only inside the nucleus. So, a proton outside does not disintegrate spontaneously into a neutron and an electron. But inside a nucleus, it is possible for it to get some energy, then get converted into a neutron and, uh, and, a, and a positron. Because when a decay takes place, then it is possible for for it to gain some of the energy uh, and uh, it can be converted into neutron and positron. So this can happen one day inside the nucleus. But this can happen outside the nucleus too, which we discussed. A neutron outside the nucleus is very unstable, we said. And it can happen inside the nucleus too. Yeah, That's what we just discussed. But this process can happen outside the nucleus too. But this cannot happen outside the nucleus. It can happen only inside the nucleus. I want you to understand this. This is very positive. Okay. Um, the example is sodium. So if I take Na, sodium 11 and 22, 
then this uh, can become neon. So 10 and 22 clearly, and this will give you a positron. Yeah? E with a plus charge, no mass, and neutrino. This is anti neutrino, this is neutrino. Negative, negative electron, anti neutrino. Positron, neutrino. Just keep that in mind. So this can happen too. So these are the two examples of beta decay. So it is possible for a nucleus to emit either an electron or a positron. But in both cases, we just need to balance these numbers. Like you balance a chemical equation, you balance a nuclear equation too. Okay. So electron, negative charge, no mass. Sulfur, it must be 16 in 32. Because you are losing an electron, so one of it has become proton, so you have 16. So, so what was before is satisfied with the after condition. That's what happens in this. So it's beta decay. The third and the last type of uh, this decay is uh, the gamma decay. Actually, uh, this decay does not result in any new uh, element. The alpha decay, you know, from uranium you got to thorium. Then, even in the case of beta decay, you ended up with uh, either sulfur or uh, neon. Right? It's a beta negative. It was sulfur, and then uh, from uh, uh, from, from phosphorus you ended up with sulfur and uh, uh, for the beta positive then you, you ended up with, uh, uh, with neon from sodium. So there was a change in the, uh, in the element. The element was changed after those two decays. The gamma decay is slightly uh, different. It's like uh, I told you it's a photon emission. Light comes out. Light in the sense uh, electromagnetic radiation comes out. Not visible, okay. it's electromagnetic radiation. It's electromagnetic radiation. So, photon or light, okay. that's what is coming out. So, there is no change in the element. Okay. Let's say, because you know, uh, when will an element change to change into another element when it loses? or gains a proton. Okay. Only then it gets changed into a different element. But here it is not so. You are losing only photon, you are losing only energy, you are not losing a charge here. Electromagnetic radiation does not have a charge. So no, no new element is going to be created out of it, but only energy is going to come out of it. But when does this come is the question. See, you, it, this accompanies, usually this accompanies um, an alpha decay or a beta decay. The first two decays, when when they happen, it, it, you're, you're, it's very likely that you're going to get the gamma decay to along with it, along with them. Why? Well, it's like this. You take an atom and you study this. So you have an electron. You excite that electron to uh, to your, to your higher orbit, and when it comes back to the the ground state, then it is going to emit energy. So that comes out as light, a photon. Okay. It can be infrared radiation or it can be ultraviolet radiation, it's again photon. So and, and when an electron gets excited into uh, other states from its ground state and uh, when it tries to make a transition from those states to the ground state, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's going to emit energy. Uh, when it's going to get excited, it will absorb energy. When it's going to come back to the ground state, it will emit energy. Yeah, light. When I say light, I keep saying that. When I say light, I mean electromagnetic waves. It can be infrared, ultraviolet, visible light, anything. Okay. So that's what happens in the case of an atom or an electron. The nucleus also does that. The nucleus, like an electron in the atom, has its own ground state and excited states at discrete levels. 
So when, when a nucleus is excited, okay, and when it comes back to its ground state, it's going to emit radiation. Okay. So what happens is generally um, when this alpha decay, the beta decay takes place, right? It takes place. The new nucleus that is created. That is an excited state. Why? Because there's a lot of energy involved. A, a bit of mass is getting converted, right? So there's a lot of energy involved. So the, the energy excites this, or uh, the nucleus. Then it, the, the, the new nucleus, the daughter nucleus, the nucleus that is produced because of this uh, decay, it has to get back to its ground state. When the nucleus tries to get back from the excited state to the ground state, it's going to emit energy just as electrons did. Okay. So, how do you even understand this? Well, it is very simple, uh, the same way that you understood the electronic thing. Uh, when they, the, the transition took place, the energy was released, right? So, likewise, you go into an excited state, and then when you come back to the ground state, then clearly you will give out energy. Okay. Uh, it's like that. So the new nucleus, first of all, the old nucleus will be in a, in a certain energy. Okay. Now, the daughter nucleus, the one which is produced now, it, it will be excited, clearly. It's a lot of energy is involved. I want you to understand that. So I'm repeating. And and that it, from the excited state, it has to come back to its normal, normal available state. Because it's a new element, it has to come back. It's 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 ground state. It, it the states which are permissible to it. Okay, so then the normal states are valid. So it, it cannot remain in the existed all the time. So it has to come back. So when it does that, this energy is released. This happens at the at the nuclear level, not at the electronic level. That's a distinction. The nucleus, like electron, will also. Uh, get excited and then come back. Hmm? I mean, think about it. Electron is a charged particle. Nucleus is also charged. There are a lot of protons there. So whatever happens to this charged particle must be happening to this. So if this can do this stuff and this can also do this stuff. That's the, uh, that's the crude understanding of, uh, a crude way of explaining why this is happening. Okay? But I think it, you'll be able to remember this because whatever is happening to an electron will happen to the proton also. So if this can get excited and then come back, then this can also get excited and then come back. Keep that in mind. Okay, see, uh, one the example that they've given you is cobalt. Okay, cobalt, it undergoes a beta negative decay. As it undergoes a beta negative decay, it becomes nickel. Okay, so let me just do that. First, now this gamma decay we're going to talk about is accompanying a beta negative decay. So let me take cobalt. So CO, this is 27, and this is 60. This gets disintegrated into nickel. Okay, this is going to be nickel, and that would be 28, and then 60. Beta negative decay, right? So it's beta negative decay. So it must emit an electron. So we're going to get 27, 28, so it must be minus 1, 0. And plus antineutrino particle, which also accompany this. Okay. Uh, so this is what is happening. But now the new neutron, the, uh, the, the daughter nucleus, the new uh, nucleus, is an excited state because energy is also going to be emitted. Right? So then what happens now is that they, from the excited state it has to come back to its, its own ground state. So then what this is what it does. So from cobalt, I'm going to draw a schematic diagram. So this is cobalt, this is cobalt 2760. Then there is this beta decay, a beta negative decay I should say, more precise. Then you see, then it will go to a new state, excited state. This is an excited state. 
and from this state it will do it will do two jumps to get to its ground state. So the first jump is this. First jump is a energy of one point one seven mega electron volt. So this, and from this to the other state, this is going to be gamma energy radiation of one point. Three three mega electron volt is released. So then you get nickel. Okay. So this is also nickel. But then nickel was an excited state. Then it emits some energy. Comes to the first one. Emits some more energy. Then comes back to its ground state. So so this is when this happens. When this is coming back to its ground state, nickel is created already. In cobalt, nickel is created. Beta nickel decay is done. Here itself you have nickel, but then nickel is in an excited state. It's like food which has been cooked. It's like uh, your rice being on the uh, on, on the oven. Okay, so your mom, your mom has cooked the food. It's very hot. You cannot use it still. It's like that. So uh, nickel is like that here, a, a hot food on the stove. Now here it is. At a stage where you can eat, so from here to here, it must release energy. It must lose energy to come back to this. It's, that's the example. Uh, I think you can relate to. So, food is ready. Food is cooked, but you can't straight away use it because it's very hot here. And then you need to wait for the food to cool down a little bit so that you can eat. So that's what's happening here. Nickel is created here itself. Beta nickel decay. Nickel is created here. Whether it is an excited state, then it releases an amount of energy. It is a certain amount of energy, and comes back to its comes to its ground state. Now this is ready. So this is what you normally found uh, a nickel, and that's a state. So here is when the gamma radiation takes place. So as I said, the gamma radiation does not produce anything new. The gamma decay does not produce anything new. It produces. Uh, it is it is taking. A, a, a nucleus from an excited state to its ground state, but look at the amount of energy, 1.17 mega electron volt. But what did we see in hydrogen? Okay. Just 13.6 electron volt. You see, where is 13? Just 13.6 electron volt. I mean, even to ionize. Okay. Uh, in fact, it was much less, right? Uh, uh, so when 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 the second state to the first state, uh, the ground state. Uh, or the first state to the ground state, like excited state to the ground state. When they jumped, then they, the energy involved, as far as uh, the uh, the hydrogen, the electron, the hydrogen atom was concerned, was only in, in a few electron volts. Okay, not here. One point one one mega electron. It's million times more. It's like that. It's so high, so high. So the frequency will also be very high. Well, you know this. Right? You know this. This e is equal to h nu. So for this, just thirteen point six electron volt is equal to h into nu. So the frequency is going to be very small for us. But then look at this. The frequency is going to be really, really, really high. Okay, so the gamma radiation, very high frequency radiations, and then they contain uh, a lot of energy. The gamma radiation. Okay. So so as you say the gamma decay is actually Photon emission, light emission, okay. uh, very high frequency. So these are the three types of decays: alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma decay. In alpha decay and beta decay, the elements change. The nucleus changes into a different nucleus. From the parent nucleus, you get a daughter nucleus. In alpha decay, alpha particles, the hydrogen, uh, sorry, helium uh, uh, nuclei are emitted. And then you get a daughter nucleus. In, in the example that we took, it was thorium. We took uranium. After alpha decay, you got thorium. So uranium was a parent, and then this is a daughter, the mother and daughter. And uh, uh, in the beta decay, you have beta negative and beta positive. In beta negative, an electron was emitted along with antineutrino. So uh, uh, basically, a neutron. 
was getting converted into a proton in the nucleus. So you went from phosphorus to sulfur. The nucleus became from phosphorus to sulfur. Then beta positive decay. You went from neon, uh, you went from sodium to neon. So you emitted a positron and a neutrino. So there the elements were changed. But here in the gamma decay, the elements are not changed. It happens only when, when an element at a higher an excited state comes back to its ground state. So then very high energy radiation comes out. So gamma radiation takes place here. There is no change in the element. There is no dot of element. So this usually accompanies this kind of a decay. Gamma decay accompanies uh, either a beta decay or an alpha decay. Yeah. So I hope you understand.